Good afternoon. Thank, uh, I am the last thing standing in the way of you and food. And I understand that. I understand the importance of that. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't say a special thanks to my good friend Roger Fairfax. Uh, Roger and his wife, Lisa, uh, if you don't know, a husband and wife team here at the George Washington University Law School, my wife's alma mater, and they are forces of nature. And not only great parents, but uh, great teachers, great mentors, great leaders, and it is a pleasure to call you a friend. And that was so long ago, the coaching you referred to, that that daughter of mine you refer to is now in the 10th grade. And that's a tribute to how long uh, we have been friends. I also want to say uh, thank you in addition to your dean and to the school and to everybody who put this on. These things just don't happen organically. They're the product of an incredible amount of work. And so I'm very grateful for uh, the effort and the collaboration. We're trying to do more with less in the department and across government. And one way we're able to do more with less is through these partnerships with our uh, generous partners like the George Washington School of Public Health. I want to say a few words, and then I really do want to uh, make sure I'm as brief as possible. Uh, it was very important. And, and let me uh, begin by also saying thank you um, to all of our panelists, because I sat here the entire time. I took notes. I especially appreciated the last question so that we have action items. Uh, the measure of the benefit of a conference is not simply the quality of the dialogue, but the quality of the follow-up. And so I have some very concrete um, thoughts and uh, things that we're going to do uh, in the aftermath of this. And so I want to thank all the panelists. It was very important to me that Ralph Boyd be on the panel today, because in this hyper-partisan city of Washington, D.C., in the misinformation era that we all too frequently find ourselves living in, it is lost with all too much frequency that civil rights enforcement is and always should be a bipartisan issue. You look at every piece of major civil rights legislation that's been passed in this nation's history, it's been a product, it's been a product of bipartisan coalition building. That is a fact. I learned that from my former boss, Ted Kennedy. You look at the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You move on to the Voting Rights Act. You move on to the Fair Housing Act of 68. You move on to the Americans with Disabilities Act. You move on to the ADA amendments. You move on to the Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Always a bipartisan coalition. And I applaud the work that Ralph Boyd did in the aftermath of 9-11, I applaud the work that his replacement, Alex Acosta, did because it was great work, not the least of which was hiring Eric Treen, uh, who has been a remarkable friend and colleague, not only then, but now. And I'm so grateful, Eric, for your wise counsel. So let's not lose sight of this bipartisan approach to civil rights. You know, you mentioned at the end of your presentation our settlement in the Berkeley case. The Berkeley case involved a very simple proposition that a person in the workplace should not have to choose between his or her religion and his or her work. And what is also notable about Berkeley, and I see Aaron here and others who were involved in the settlement of that case, and we just settled that case. The victim recovered $75,000. The school will be engaged in training to ensure that they understand the obligations in the religious, religious accommodation context. But what's notable, but all too frequently unreported about this issue, is that this is simply another in the long line of cases involving religious accommodation that are part of the proud bipartisan tradition of the Civil Rights Division and the department and the administration just a few years before this case, the Bush administration brought a virtually identical religious accommodation case at the EEOC while Commissioner Ishimaru was there. I applaud that work. It was the right thing to do. We've brought religious accommodation cases on behalf of people of all faiths who've wanted, whether it's to go on a Hajj in the Berkeley case or a number of cases in the 90s and beyond involving 
uh, people of different faiths, Christian faiths and others who wanted similar accommodation. Again, if there's a lesson to take away from today is that civil rights, notwithstanding what you may read in the blogs and in our hyper-partisan Washington, D.C., remains a source of bipartisan consensus that we must always remind ourselves of. The second lesson for me today, and I find myself when I listen here thinking about uh, Senator Kennedy and I, when Jim Zogby mentioned the aftermath of 9-11, getting a call out of the blue from Senator Kennedy. I can't say I was surprised that was the kind of man he was. But I'm sitting here thinking what he would say were he here. And what he would say is that we have come a long way as a nation, but we certainly have a long way to go. Civil rights, he said with frequency, remains the unfinished business of America. And in today's sessions, we have reflected on the progress we have made. We have seen the work that was done in the immediate aftermath and the leadership of President Bush, the leadership of our Assistant Attorney General Ralph Boyd, and the dedication of the career staff in the Civil Rights Division, in the EEOC, and elsewhere toward ensuring that we send a very clear message that we are one America. We are one nation with liberty and justice for all. And all has no asterisks. And that was a critical message that was sent in the aftermath of 9-11. But we continue to be reminded, and this discussion underscored it, that we have a ways to go, that we must continue to have the open and honest and critical dialogue. And you saw a robust debate uh, on our second panel. That's exactly the America that we are so indeed proud of. And that's my segue into my next sets of observations, is that our actions are really covered or governed by the principles of engagement, action, reflection, and recalibration. Engagement is critical. And we heard correctly from the imam that the Muslim community, the Arab community, the Sikh, the South Asian community, they are our first line of defense very often when we are trying to solve crimes in this country. So why should we do engagement? We should do engagement because the people in this room and the people across this country in the Muslim, Sikh, Arab, and South Asian communities have been our partners in crime solving. And we are so grateful for that. We do the engagement so that we can listen and learn about what we're doing well. And we can listen and learn about areas where we have room for improvement. And that's why we have engagement. Engagement begets action. And I'm very proud of the actions we've taken in the Civil Rights Division under the leadership of this Attorney General and with the remarkable commitment of the career staff. I talked about the employment context, but you talk about the Arlupa context, and Eric has been leading those efforts. Mazen Basrawi has been a critical colleague in these efforts. We've done about 25 cases in the zoning context since Arlupa was passed. 2000 was, our, I think, Arlupa, roughly. 25 cases involving efforts of the Muslim community to either build or expand mosques and community centers. 15 of those have been in the last 15 months. So if you're looking for those bellwethers of this climate of intolerance, this headwind of intolerance that we're sailing into, that's one data point, and regrettably there are many others. Our bullying work, the two areas of greatest growth in our bullying work are LGBT, context and the Muslim, Arab, Sikh, and South Asian context. Kids who are Somali in the Twin Cities being told, go back to your country, you terrorists. You don't belong. This is their country, the United States of America. They are leaders in this community, and we should acknowledge it as such. That is the two growth areas. Those are the two growth areas that I mentioned in our bullying work, and I'm so proud of the work we continue to do and have done in that regard. We continue to see in this past fiscal year, which ended just a few weeks ago, we prosecuted more hate crimes in this past fiscal year than any year in over a decade, thanks to the leadership 
of our career staff and thanks to the partnership with our U.S. attorneys. We now have, in the main justice, in our 94 outposts, remarkable sentries, remarkable leaders and experts in civil rights enforcement. And that partnership will sustain so that long after the clock strikes midnight for me, I will be exceedingly confident that we have a remarkably robust civil rights enforcement capacity in the federal government. I talked about reflection and recalibration, and let me give you two examples of the need for continuing reflection and recalibration. You may recall the Christmas Day attempted bombing on the airplane, and you will recall the aftermath of that bombing in which certain protocols were put in place that made categorical targeting, that is to say, um, individuals from certain countries were categorically being asked a series of additional questions. What did we hear in the aftermath of that? We heard a lot of feedback from people in this room and leaders across the country that we could do a better job, that we should be using a scalpel, not a meat ax, and that we should reconsider what's happening. And a few months later, as you know, and thanks to you, we did just that and the Department of Homeland Security recalibrated what it was doing. And I think as a result, it was a more effective enforcement mechanism because once again, we must always remember, as Jim Cole told us this morning, don't fall into the trap of thinking that it's either safe streets, secure borders and secure communities, or protection of civil rights and civil liberties. It, asks, it will always be both. And it must always be both, because what happened to Stewart's family can never happen to anyone else in America. And so I am grateful for the ongoing dialogue and for the trust that has grown from that dialogue that enabled us to have that conversation. And I am grateful, and I don't see the imam in the audience right yet, and I'm sure he's probably here or he's probably at another event already, but I categorically agree with him. He has every right to be upset about the issue of the trainings because the Attorney General is equally upset. The Deputy Attorney General is upset. The FBI Director is upset. And we're upset because we have accomplished so much. I see people like Dwight Holton. I see people like Barb McQuaid, the US Attorney in Detroit, who has formed such robust partnerships and has done so much good in that community in collaboration with key stakeholders. I see the US attorney in the Eastern District of uh, California. We went out, we've done remarkable engagement out there. Ben Wagner is his name. And I see all the great work and I recognize the words of my mother that it only takes one or two incidents to make all that great work seem part of the past. And so, we have to make sure that we have the quality control across the board. That's a critical element of our recalibration. And we already have put systems in place to get at that. And that is what we will continue to do. We will continue to engage. We will continue to act. We will continue to reflect. And we will continue to recalibrate whenever necessary to ensure that the false choice that some would have between security and civil rights is indeed a false choice. We heard one of the speakers this morning talk about how she was scared in Tennessee. And that one, as much as anything, sticks in my mind. Because you know what? I've spent a lot of time in Tennessee, Murfreesboro, Columbia, and elsewhere. And I heard most recently from imams down there. I'm scared in the year 2011. My kids don't want to go to school in 2011 because they're scared of being bullied. And so there's a certain element of the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I'm reminded of the Know Nothing movement of the mid 19th century, where the concern that catapulted the election of many people in places like the Boston area, the San Francisco area, was the argument 
that if you elect and allow these Catholics to take over the world, they will impose their version of Sharia law and we will be transformed into a nation of fealty to the Bible and nothing else. Well, the Know Nothing movement was defeated and it is part of our history. But it was defeated because people across an ideological spectrum rose up. They did not sit silent. They did not sit back. They came together just like shoulder to shoulder and other movements are coming together. And so I leave you with an immense sense of optimism that notwithstanding all of these data points that point to this headwind of intolerance, that there are remarkable people in this nation and in this room who can transform that headwind of intolerance into a tailwind of inclusion and opportunity and respect for everyone. That is what the Civil Rights Division is about, and that is what America is about. And that is what we will continue to aspire to do day in and day out, 24-7. That doesn't mean we're going to agree all the time. There will be times where we have honest differences of opinion. But if we don't talk, and if we don't actively listen, and if we don't reflect and recalibrate where necessary, then we won't be doing our job. And you have our continuing commitment toward that end. <laughs> So on behalf of the Attorney General, and on behalf of the President, and on behalf of my colleagues in the career ranks of the Civil Rights Division, thank you for coming, thank you for your leadership, and let's all move on to action that will build a better America. Thank you.